Well, hey, everybody, it's Donna Parto, and I'm so excited to be welcoming you to this very special presentation, What to Do When You Don't Know What God Is Doing. And I'm going to share in a few minutes the story of how God laid this on my heart, but I just wanted to open this up to you, and uh, I, I pray it's going to be an encouragement. So, God, the reality is, in our most transparent moments, we never know what you're doing <laughs> because your thoughts are so high above our thoughts and your ways are so high above our ways that even when we think we know what you're doing, we're probably wrong. And until we stand before you, the reality is this applies every day. Every day, we don't know what you're doing. We think we know what you're doing, but we, we don't. We don't. So this message is, is universal and applicable daily to all of us. And, and God, I pray that you would introduce into our hearts and minds heaping doses of humility and a willingness to recognize that things are not always what they seem, that we see now as through a glass darkly, that we see only shadows of things to come. But you see the full picture. You know the full plan. You alone. And so we yield ourselves to you now, God, and we say, would you come, Holy Spirit, and would you speak to your children would you speak to your children? Would you inspire? Would you encourage? And would you equip your people today? Amen. Amen. So glad that you could join me today. I've been giving this a lot of thought over the last month. When we set out on a journey to obey God, a few things happen. Uh, there are a few things. Number one, we can be confident that everything will go smoothly because we are on a journey to obeying God. So everything's just going to be smooth sailing. That's, that's how we will know we're heading in the right direction. That's how we and, and everyone around us will know that God is truly with us. Wouldn't it be great if that were actually true? <laughs> None of those things are true. None of those things are true. And I'll give you an example from the book of Acts. And I'll just kind of retell chapter 27, then we'll dive into chapter 28. So Paul um, is in you know constant drama. Whenever he preaches... There's drama, drama, drama. There's riots, there's conflicts, there's beatings and stonings, and it's just crazy. And he gets into another one of these kerfuffles, and he appeals to Caesar and says, send me to Caesar. And they say, you know, we really, you weren't really doing anything serious. We would have let you go, but you've appealed to Caesar, and so to Caesar you're going to go. You're going to go to Rome. And Paul felt strongly that his destiny was to go to Rome and to stand before Caesar and, and, and to preach, really. And so he sets off on this journey, and it's recounted in Acts chapter 27. We're not going to dive into the whole thing, but it is one disaster after another. It's, it's a two-week hurricane, a hurricane so bad that no one eats anything, and then finally they're shipwrecked on this island, First, the boat won't go at all. Then the boat's going too fast. I mean, just an ordeal. Nothing, nothing is going right in Acts chapter 27, even though Paul is steadfastly doing his best to obey God and to devote his life to what he believes God wants him to do. And that brings us to Acts chapter 28. Once safely on shore, what, what, what is, when is once safely? That's after this absolutely catastrophic journey that ends in shipwreck. Okay. 
Once safely in shore, we found that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because we had just survived a hurricane. So that, that's the things are looking up now. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and, as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself onto his hand. So, so now it's a downturn, right? Ups and downs. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off from the fire and suffered no ill effects. So now now we're on the upward trend again. (laughs) The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a God. See how fickle people are? See how tumultuous circumstances are? Ever-changing. They're up, they're down. Paul ministers on this island for three months. The Bible specifically tells us the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed, and they needed everything because they had lost it all in the hurricane. And then Paul goes on to Rome, and he preaches in Rome under house arrest for two years, tells us in verse 31. And, and this is the end of the book of Acts, right? Boldly and without hindrance, preached the gospel of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's what Paul was doing for two years. And that's the end of the book of Acts. Paul was released in AD 62. He was then rearrested, imprisoned, and martyred under Nero's persecution in AD 66. So th- this is the end of the book of Acts, and it's, it's pretty close to the end of, of Paul's life. He's got, a, you know, he's got a few more years left. And I, I just want to give a few keys from Paul's example, and then I want to share some stuff that God laid on my heart from my own journey. Number one is to hold on to the mission. He felt his mission was to be a minister of the gospel. And even when he was shipwrecked on a tiny island, guess what he kept doing? He kept being a minister. And stay open to whatever God wants to do. Maybe God just wanted to heal some people on that island. We don't know. Paul thought, hey, I've got to, to," and he even said to them, I'm in a big hurry. I've I've got to get to Rome. Well, maybe, maybe God had other ideas. We don't know. But stay open to whatever God wants to do. And then assume God has you where he wants you and trust that he can get you where you need to go when you need to get there. So Paul has this three month detour. Is it the devil? Is it people? Is it God? We don't know because we're not God. So what we can do is just be faithful where we are and be fully present. He lands on the island and starts doing whatever needs to be done. You know what needed to be done? They needed to build a fire. So he he built a fire. And then somebody was sick, so they needed to be healed. So he, he healed them. Be fully present and alert to what God is doing where you are. And shake the snake. If circumstances bite you, If someone attacks you, just shake it off. Somebody need to just shake it off. It doesn't matter what other people think. Wow, that happened to her? That person attacked her? Wow, that must have some... Some great meaning. Let's all have an opinion about that. Paul just shakes it off. He's like, I don't know. This snake bit me. I don't know what it means here. I'm but I'm 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 not going to get overly focused on it. I'm just going to shake it off. And remember, it's it's how you conduct yourself on the journey that matters. This is a famous Joyce Meyer quote here. Enjoy where you are on the way to where you're going. Paul ended up having a grand old time on the island of Malta. It started with a shipwreck and a snake bite. I mean, a lot of us would have been, that's it. I'm, that's it. This is a disaster. I'm depressed. I give up. But no. 
Paul just kept right on, he's like, you know, kept right on going, ended up becoming friends with everybody there. And again, you think God is doing one thing and he may be doing something else entirely. And I'm going to share with you some things. So these, I can't give you chapter and verse on all of these, but as I've prayed about it, just kind of put these out for your consideration. First of all, we do know that Paul had a grand old time in Malta. And then he went to Rome, probably believing his most important mission was to preach in Rome. And I suspect he wanted to preach and keep on preaching because that's what he was doing. He was going from place to place preaching. And we could, it would be a whole nother message to dive into to some of those experiences of his because they weren't what you think they were. But when he got to Rome, they put him in prison. But he made the most of that circumstance too. And do you know what he did? He wrote letters. Those letters called epistles constitute the majority of the New Testament. The prison letters include Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. See, here's here's my conviction. Paul believed he was going to Rome to preach. Actually, he, he was going to Rome to write. One of the main criticisms of Paul was that he wasn't a very impressive speaker in an age where people listened to speakers for sport. I meant to put in the verse, but it, basically they say, you know, Paul, you're really impressive in your letters, but when you show up, you, are, you ain't all that in a bag of chips. Peter was the great speaker. God sat Paul down in a prison cell. Because although he certainly called him to preach to his contemporaries, can we not safely conclude that his writing was a far more important calling? Maybe you've never thought of this. And and this is something we'll have to ask God when we get there. Yes, Paul was called to preach. He was sent to uh, to the Gentiles and to the Jews, Jews and Gentiles. He went to both. But, but think about it. Those letters have what sh- is what shaped the church. We, we think we know what God is doing, but again, often God is doing something different. Paul wanted to preach. He did. But he wrote letters that for 2,000 years have preached to the whole world. Again, contrast Peter and Paul. Peter only has, is it two? First, first and second Peter? Did I get it wrong? I might have gotten that wrong. Paul, you know, wrote the preponderance of the New Testament. Again, this is a tiny bit of conjecture here. But I think Peter was the better preacher. And Paul was the better writer. And Peter, Peter's mission was preaching and laying a foundation in Jerusalem and in the early church. And Paul created the theology in the scripture that it's endured for thousands of years. And both of those roles were extraordinarily important. But Peter wasn't Paul and Paul wasn't Peter. They each had their own destiny in God. And this is what I want to say. Just when it looks like God is limiting you, he might very well be expanding your territory. When Paul was sitting in that jail cell, I don't know what he thought. Did he think about, you know, wait a minute, is, is, is Peter still out there preaching to huge crowds and they all respond to him? We know there was a little bit of rivalry between these two men. Again, I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious because they are apostles and and they're both pillars in the founding of the church. But if we're honest, they were human beings and there was a tiny bit of rivalry there. And I wonder if if Paul felt maybe God was limiting him by putting him in a, a prison cell. He couldn't travel. He couldn't go to synagogues. He couldn't preach outdoors and stir up riots anymore. God wasn't limiting him. 
God was expanding him. God wasn't reducing his opportunity for impact. God was exponentially increasing his opportunity for impact. I I know that this is a little bit off the beaten path of of what we typically think when we ponder the lives of Peter and Paul, but let me just put it out there. And as you read God's word and read the New Testament and read the dynamics, just consider. And meanwhile, hold on to hope, knowing that God is working and he is answering your prayers and he's directing your path even when it doesn't look that way. Okay, so now here's my story. So you know I'm here in Columbia, and I thought, you know, much like Paul, I thought I was coming here primarily to preach. The last time I was here, I preached 50 times in 83 days. It's all I did. All day, every day, I ran from church. Sometimes I'd do two, three churches in a single day. Preach, 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 preach. And so I assumed that when God said, okay, well, now we're going to take another one of those journeys, I want you to go preach, 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 preach. And I got here, and it's, it's, it's looking very different. God has a very different mission for me this year. And I was sitting in an outdoor cafe, and I'm like, well, God, so can you, could you just you know, ex- explain exactly what you're doing <laughs> so, so I can be really clear? And it was like the Lord said, what, what am I doing? <laughs> I, I'm doing what I'm doing. The question isn't what, what I'm doing. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing? And it's like, it it was almost like God said, quit looking over my shoulder. Have you ever been in an office? Or even this happens in in our personal lives, right? We're, We're trying to get some work done. We're doing what we're doing. And here's somebody else. They want to look over our shoulders and check up on us and supervise. And it was almost like God was saying, Donna, I don't don't need you looking over my shoulder. I don't need you checking up on me to to see what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. This is my job. I'm God. This, This is what I do for a living. I don't need you involved in supervising. And I wonder how often we do that. How often do we look over God's shoulder and say, well, God, what, what exactly are you doing over there? What's it looking like? How am I fitting in? Where exactly are you taking me and why and when and how? And, and God said to me, spoke to me so clearly and said, this is what you need to be doing. While I'm doing my job over here, you don't need to be looking over my shoulder. You need to go back to your little desk, <laughs> go back to your cubicle and get back to work. And specifically, this is what you need to be doing. And I just grabbed a piece of paper and I just scribbled down a whole bunch of notes of what I need to be doing when I'm not clear what God is doing. And that's where this teaching began. And so I'm just going to share those with you. They're not in any particular order. And some of them will really touch some of you and others will resonate with others. But I'm kind of excited to share these with you and I pray that they'll resonate. So The first thing that you need to do when you don't know what God is doing is know that God is for you. Believe that God is good, that God wants the best for you, and nothing happens in your life that is beyond God's ability to redeem. Number two, shrink the devil. Many Christians today seem to believe the devil is more involved in directing their affairs than God. Our devil is too big. He ain't all that. You know, did the devil make the ship crash? Did the devil make the snake bite him? Did the devil do that? Yeah, maybe. We don't know. But Paul didn't seem to get off on on a tangent with that. He just kept on doing what he was doing. He kept doing the next thing. Shrink people. (laughs) I better quickly clarify what I mean like that. I mean, in your mind especially those who hurt or oppose you. Again, too many of us live like we believe people are large and in charge. Read chapter Acts 27. All these different people with different agendas. And Paul, in, in the natural, was completely in their hands. 
He appeared to be at their mercy. He was a prisoner, and they were the soldiers, and they were the ship captain, and they were the people who were running the show. And his life was, quote, in their hands. But none of that is true. It's not true. Even as a prisoner, those people weren't really in charge of Paul. Because people are actually very small and utterly powerless in the face of God's agenda. If God wants to do something in your life, there's not a human being on earth who can stop him. And then shrink yourself. If you think your mistakes and missteps are bigger than God, then your God is not, is he not really God, is he? Your God is too small. When God designed the plan for your life, he factored you into the equation. So just kind of start with a reality check. And then number five, don't, don't overrate your circumstances. It's true that God does sometimes speak to us through our circumstances, but often... He's not saying what we think he's saying. It's easy to misread circumstances. So read more into his word and less into your circumstances because circumstances can deceive us, but God's word never will. Number six, rewrite your life story with God in the starring role. I mean, if you woke up this morning, it should be obvious that your life story isn't over yet. And there are many chapters yet to be written. The human heart resonates with a comeback story for a reason. Think of your favorite movie, your favorite book, true life example, Rocky, Seabiscuit, Secretariat. They're all comeback stories. God God only writes one genre. He writes comeback stories. Jesus is a comeback story. Killed him, put him in a grave. Guess what? He came back. (laughs) Christianity is the ultimate comeback story. And God wants to write a comeback story in your life. So, So all the things that have gone before are just a setup for the moment when the music changes and everyone starts cheering for the victory. But we don't know what that's going to look like. Number seven, don't try to open doors or crawl through windows. Understand God opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. It's not your job to open doors. That's God's job. Again, Paul sat on that island for three months. He didn't try to swim to Rome. He didn't make a little raft and try to paddle there. He waited for God to provide a way for him to get to the next step in the journey. And Mick, again, while he waited, what did he do? Wait on God, not for him. Let me see if I can kind of clarify what I'm saying here. Often we think we're waiting for God when, in fact, he's waiting for us. Waiting on God, when I say that, I mean spending time waiting on God, waiting on the Lord. That's time in his presence, time in his presence, being filled, filled, filled. That's waiting on God, waiting on God. Waiting for God is like sitting there tapping your watch, saying, okay, God, when are you going to do something? When are you going to change things around here? Do you see the difference? If God has you hidden for a season, it's usually for a reason because you need to do more waiting on him and less waiting for him. And often often the reason is related to the condition of our spirit, soul, and body, but not always. Sometimes while we're waiting, God is busy working on someone else that he will use to position us. We have no idea why God delayed Paul for three months on that island. But he had a reason. Maybe there were things in Rome that needed to get into alignment. Maybe there were some people and players and changes and circumstances that needed to unfold. We know that when Paul arrives in Rome, that there's a bunch of people ready to welcome him, and he ends up 
living in his own little place with a lot of freedom. And so maybe God was just moving some other people and circumstances into position so that when Paul arrived, it was like, okay. They were ready to receive him. So we're waiting on God, yes, but we're not, we're not waiting for him. Waiting on him is active. Waiting on him is an attitude of, of expectation. In fact, one of the things that's interesting, I'm learning Spanish, and the word esperar not only means hope and wait, it means expect. I'll say it again, esperar. Not only means wait, it means hope and expect. So we need to esperar. And it's really just an attitude. In, in, a, in a spiritual place of expecting. Number nine, when you feel like you're hiding in the shadows, it's time to partner with God to make your shadow dangerous. And how you handle seasons of obscurity is a critical part of the spiritual process. We see this throughout scripture. On that tiny island, Paul set a fire. I, I, I think it's kind of significant that the first thing Paul did was, was get ready to start a fire. And it was a literal fire, but I think it was also a spiritual fire. He set a fire and started healing the sick. He wasn't in the, again, Rome, famous, powerful, epicenter, influence, obvious. But, but Paul's not there <laughs> in Acts 28. That he's not there. Right? He's, he's hidden away. People don't even know where he is. They didn't have Skype. They didn't have cell phones. He just disappeared off the map. Think about this. He's hidden for three months on this tiny island. And the first thing he did was light a fire. So if you feel like, you know what, I, I feel like I've fallen off the map over here. I don't know what God is doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I think I better start a fire. Number 10, be careful who you listen to. Again, if you read chapter uh, Acts 27, a lot of people giving advice and direction even into Acts 28, Paul didn't listen to any of them. Paul was not moved by people's opinions. He's like, oh, look, I know what God said. I'm going where I'm going. That's it. Ignore any voice that says, did God really say? Eve listened to that voice, and all of humanity has paid a price for it. So surround yourself as, as far as possible with people who are full of faith. Not only faith in God, but faith in you and, and in your destiny. And if you are not surrounded by people who are full of faith, demonstrate your faith and watch it catch fire. And then they'll become people of faith. That's what Paul did. 11, get, get healthy physically. Daniel is a perfect example. God allowed him to be dragged from his home, taken prisoner to a foreign land. Now we know that, again, we know the rest of the story, but he certainly did not know what God was doing. And what's the first thing he did? He focused on getting healthy and staying healthy. It's hard to act right when you don't feel right. And of course there are exceptions, but they are exceptions. When you eat, what you eat has a direct effect on your mood and your emotions, which in a turn affects everything around you. So take care of your health. Again, some of these are just really practical. Hope that's okay. What, what should you do when you don't know what God is doing? Get help for your soul. Because hurt people hurt people. If, if there's an open wound in your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, you'll, you'll often do more harm than good in the world, even when you have the best of intentions. So get healthy in your spirit and get healthy in your soul and your body. Number 13, stay planted in the house of the Lord. 
When you don't know what God is doing, the temptation is to withdraw. But when you don't know what God is doing, it's more important than ever to stay engaged with the body of Christ. God does his best work within the context of committed iron sharpening iron relationships. 14, be a student of the word. Whatever you're going through, you can be sure that someone in the Bible went through something similar. And their example is given for your encouragement. I've been spending a lot of time in Joseph. Stay tuned. I'm going to be writing a book about the life of Joseph. What an example he is. How many, 13 years, 13 years in slavery and in prison, not knowing what God was doing, shaping him, molding him. Number 15, partner with the Holy Spirit in the purification process. The Bible says without holiness, no one will see the Lord and that the pure in heart will see God. And I just want to give it again, a little bit of a a spin on that, if it's okay. I mean, I, I don't think it's, I think what God is saying here is it will see him here and now. We're, we're, we're all going to see God in heaven, right? Maybe he's talking about seeing him here and now. God is always at work, but when our hearts are pure, we see him. We see him. Have you ever had this experience? Where you just, you just weren't seeing God and then you went into it, something happened and you got spiritually on fire again and all of a sudden you're like, wow, okay, so now I'm seeing. Now I'm seeing God at work. Now I'm seeing him in, in everyone, in everything, and in, in every circumstance. I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was like, I could, I could see God in, in every song, in every step. I've shared this before in my favorite movies, Amazing Grace. Um, William Wil- Wilberforce becomes a Christian, and he, he shares like, wow, I, 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 I see God in spider's webs now. You know, every, everywhere I look, I'm like, wow, God created that. God made that. God loves that person. We see him. He's always working, but, but sometimes our, our eyes are so focused on the things of this world. We're not seeing him. And I cover that seven-step process in, my, in the free webinar that I do, An Hour in the Presence of God's Power. I kind of spell out the seven-step process of really partnering with the Holy Spirit so that he can do a deep work of, of purification. And the primary fruit of this purification process, it's, it's humility. And remember, God opposes the proud, but honors, exalts, and elevates the humble. Number 16, develop skill. David had this great prophecy over his life. He was going to be the king. Next up, he was back taking care of the sheep, completely forgotten. You see this pattern throughout the Bible from start to finish. Call of God, season of obscurity. And in that season, when probably didn't know what God was doing. Certainly didn't look the way he thought it would look. David learned to kill things with a slingshot. J.L. mastered the art of hammering a tent peg. Abigail discovered how to throw together a great meal in a hairy. Joseph practiced running a household, then running a prison. Paul wrote a lot of letters. We, we only think about the ones included in the Bible, but there were others. I, I often tell the story, especially to young people. God called me into ministry. I was, I think, 19 years old. God spoke to me so clearly. The day after I became a Christian, beautiful moonlit night, and he said, Donna, I'm going to take you all over the world, and I'm going to use you in a mighty way for my kingdom. I was so excited. And within about a month, I made a series of choices, turn of events, that resulted in me dropping out of college and taking a job as a part-time 
temporary receptionist type typist. Now, like, Lord, wait a minute. I thought you said it was going to be used by you in a mighty way all over the world. And I'm like just sitting here typing. But I learned to type 120 words per minute, which is why I can write a book like Becoming a Vessel God Can Use in four days because I can type faster than I can talk. I can type faster than I can think. I've written 30 books, most of them 10 days, two weeks. Rarely would take me more than a couple weeks to write a book because I developed a skill in a season of obscurity, in a season when I didn't know what God was doing and it didn't look the way I thought it was going to look. Read the Bible under the... I'm telling you, put on this pair of glasses <laughs> of the things I'm teaching you right here and you will see this in the Bible from cover to cover. Never underestimate the importance of diligence because God honors and elevates the diligent. And you could be diligent. Joseph was just diligently running a prison and God elevated him to the second in command of one of the greatest civilizations in human history. Paul was just diligently sitting in prison writing letters. He's like, well, I guess I can't preach anymore. But I'll write them letters, make sure they're doing okay. Remind them of some things. He did not know. He did not know that 2,000 years later, that would be this thing that we call the Bible. He was just trying to be diligent. Develop skill as a, as a theologian and a, and a leader and a founder in the church. Does it, I hope this is making sense. And then 17, seek clarity about your calling, that this is where it's going to get controversial, but I've already stepped into it, so I'm going to go all the way. <laughs> While you should develop skill in whatever you do and do it all for the glory of God, beware of a lifetime spent seeking incremental improvement outside your gifting. Discover what God has placed you on this earth to do, your primary gifting, and excel in it. Again, example from my life. At some point, I stopped typing other people's letters and became a Christian author and really began to focus on my calling. And we'll have to ask Paul when we get there, okay? It's a tiny bit of conjecture. Again, I'm going to keep giving these provisos, but I, I don't think Paul's primary gifting was preaching. He went, in, he went into the Areopolis, or Areopagus, in Athens, and gave that relevant message and quoted their poets and tried to be relevant. And now everybody uses that as like a model for ministry of what we should do in the church. They forget to read the context. Paul walked from his, his ministry in Athens completely bombed. No church was started there. There's like never been a church there. There is no letter to Athens. It didn't work trying to go in and, and be a persuasive speaker. It didn't work. And we know it didn't work because the next place he goes, the Bible shows us in the book of Acts, next he goes to Corinthians. And when he writes letters to the Corinthians, he's like, you know, I kind of figured it out in Athens. I wasn't really good at being a persuasive, wise, clever speaker that you guys all love to listen to. So when I came to you, I just came in the demonstration of the Spirit's power. I, I kind of got over the idea that I was going to be one of the guys debating and being a great speaker to entertain everybody. His primary call was the letters. Number 18, be alert to opportunities. See, too many of us kind of sleepwalk through our day and we miss opportunities that are right there in front of us. Was it Thomas Edison? It was some famous person. I meant to look it up. 
He said, opportunity is missed by most people because it comes dressed in overalls and looks like work. See, notice Paul ministered at every opportunity instead of waiting for his big opportunity in Rome. I'll say that again. Paul ministered at every opportunity instead of waiting for his big opportunity in Rome. There are opportunities around us all day, every day. I'm getting ready to teach live my book, Becoming a Vessel God Can Use. And the reality is all of us can be a vessel every day. There are people that God places on your path who need healing in some area of their life, wherever they are. That's what Paul did. It's like, I'm going to go to Rome and I'm going to preach. Meanwhile, I'm on this island and there's some hurting people. I'll just minister to them. That's, that's humility. That's humility. Lord, let me just be diligent to do whatever's at hand today. Nineteen. There's just a couple more. I hope these are helpful. I know I'm stretching you. I can feel it. (laughs) Become a forgiving person. See, here's a prophetic word you can write down and stand on. You will be hurt. People will treat you terribly. Count on it. Especially you want to step out in ministry. You want to be someone who makes a difference in the world. So it's not enough to forgive. The secret is becoming a forgiving person. It's not just something you do. It's fundamentally who you are. And the key is getting a supernatural heart transplant. So God's heart is beating in your breast. Forgiveness becomes as natural as breathing. The Bible commands us to clothe yourselves with compassion. So some of us, some of us need to change outfits. Number 20 is to develop wisdom. What should you do when you don't know what God is doing? Develop wisdom. Stephen K. Scott vowed to read a chapter in the book of Proverbs every day and to use it as his sole guide to success. Most of you know I met him. I was on uh, the Paula White show, and he was the other guest. Kind of got to know him a little bit. He began with nothing and became a billionaire. God, God loves you. God loves us too much to bring us opportunities before we have developed the wisdom required to make the most of them. So develop wisdom. And watch God begin to open new doors of opportunity for you. And then here's the last one. Number 21, be in the world, but not of it. Be in the world, but not of it. And I want to challenge all of us, including me. Let's take our daily routine to the foot of the cross. Are you in the world more than You are in the word. Are you in the world more than you are in his presence? And of course, again, we all have firm commitments. We have appointments. We have responsibilities. We have jobs. We have have things we have to do. But we can practice the presence of God anywhere. And the real issue is what do we do with our uncommitted time? Why not conduct a weekly time inventory? This is something I shared almost 30 years ago. Take one week and just kind of every hour, make a, make a quick note of what, what you did for the better part of that hour. Just one week. And, and determine, where, where, where is that, especially that uncommitted time, where, where is that going? Are there areas that could be redeemed? Are there, are there moments when you could pull back from this, the things of this world? and really press into what matters, the presence of God and the word of God. So maybe maybe do a time inventory and determine some areas of your life that have slowly drifted away from the straight and narrow road into the world's fast lane. Again, notice how God took Paul away from the hustle and bustle. He was going from city to city to city. God took him to the small, quiet island. He said, yeah, maybe let's just come away to a quiet place after the shipwreck and the snake bite where you can rest.
And sometimes we just need to kind of pull back, reevaluate, and say, okay, I'm in the fast lane. I need to breathe and, and reshift my focus on what matters most. And that's the call of God on my life. I have this consecration prayer by John G. Lake. I thought I would close with this. My God and Father, in Jesus' name I come to you. Take me as I am. Make me what I ought to be in spirit, in soul, and body. Give me power to do right. If I have wronged any, to repent, to confess, to restore. No matter what it cost me, wash me in the blood of Jesus that I may now become your child and manifest you in a perfect spirit, a holy mind, and a sick, sick it should be sick list, forgive me, sick list body. Amen. And I'm, I'm going to pray, and then I want to share a few things, a few announcements. God, we thank you for the example of the scripture. We thank you for the example of the life of Paul. We thank you for those things that worked out really well and, and, and looked successful. And we thank you for the moments of transparency and brokenness, as in the letters to the Corinthians, where he says, you know, we, we, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and, and not from us. And I, I'm, I'm not going to try anymore to be impressive and persuasive and wise in people's eyes. I just want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know you, God. I want to be present. I want to serve you. So we thank you for his example. That even in those moments when he didn't know what you were doing, in those moments when he thought he knew, but it wasn't turning out the way he thought it would, that he continued to set an example of diligence, of faithfulness, of servant-heartedness. And I pray today that this, his life, as we looked at it, it was coming to the end, that it spoke volumes today, and that it will continue in um, the days and even weeks to come to minister to the hearts of each healer. Amen.